All right. Uh, good morning. Um, my area of expertise is actually modern and medieval Jewish thought, so uh, definitely not Josephus. Um, it's a uh, pleasure to be here this morning uh, to begin our collective thinking about the enigmatic figure of Salome. I would like to begin by thanking Emil Homerin, the chair of the Department of Religion and Classics, my boss, for asking me to con contribute, <laughs> again, <laughs> hence my performance, um, uh, uh, for asking me to contribute this little work to this little workshop, one that certainly promises to show the exciting potential for cross-pollination between the humanistic study of religion in addition to other disciplines and uh, the fine arts. I have been asked to speak, as the rather generic sounding title of my presentation should clearly tell you, on the literary depiction of Salome made by the famed turncoat historian Josephus. And I'll explain more about that in, in just a little bit. Who went by, who went by the, uh, well, right, whose name Josephus is, is uh, definitely Latinized. Uh, Josephus is the first to give Salome a name, and in giving her a name, he necessarily brings her to life by connecting her to some of the various events that occur offstage in the biblical narrative. In giving her a name, I wish to argue, he is the very first to engage in the art of Salome's depiction, the first in a long line of male artists who have sought to capture and harness the seductive allure of not just Salome, but of female beauty more generally. Yet, and this is a crucial yet, Josephus' Salome is not the Salome we have come to understand. Ever since her dramatic entree into the annals of Western literature in the New Testament, the still as of yet unnamed Salome has loomed largely in the collective imagination of the West the subject of numer numerous depictions in literary arts and other media. She has attracted, as we will hear throughout the day, the likes of Titian, Caravaggio, Gustave Flaubert, Oscar Wilde, and of course, Richard Strauss, to name some of the, famous, the most famous artists associated with her representation or even re-representation. Imagined as equal part seductress, femme fatale, abused child, and erotic dancer, her suggestive movements of her performance of sexual innuendo, innuendo, I think I said that right the first time, draws men in and makes them give her what she wants regardless of consequence. However, like any figure from antiquity, Moses, King David, Jesus, it is difficult to separate fact from fiction. It is we who project onto them our own fascinations and our own desires. It is we who make Salome dance what we have subsequently called an erotically charged dance of the seven veils. It is we who, in giving her a name, have paradoxically stripped her of her individuality. Salome now becomes the great female seductress whose dance led to the murder of, jo of Joan, John the Baptist. Um, the later iteration of Elijah, according to uh, subsequent Christian hagiographers, the baptizer of Jesus, and the self-styled harbinger of the messianic era. She simultaneously enthralls and repels us. But is it the Salome of the New Testament that we are interested in? Or without wanting to come out as a closeted Jungian, something much deeper and more primal? Who then was Salome? Both the sixth book of Mark and the 14th book of Matthew in the New Testament give her a face, but not a name. I shall mention the story briefly, as I'm certain that my other colleagues here today will go into considerably greater detail on many of the biblical and other specifics. According to Mark's gospel, her mother, Herodias, bore a grudge against John the Baptist for stating that Herod's marriage to her was incestuous according to Jewish law since she had previously been married to his brother. And according to Jewish law, you can marry your brother. If the, if the, if the one brother dies, then you can, you're supposed to marry, the, uh, you can marry another brother, but she left the one brother for the other brother. So, it wasn't a, uh, so that was the violation. Mark tells us that she encouraged her daughter to demand that the critic of this union, to wit, John the Baptist, be executed. Let me quote from the, uh, the, the requisite passage in Mark. Herod, on his birthday, made a supper to his lords high captains, and chief estates of Galilee. And when the daughter of the said Herodias came in and danced and pleased Herod and those that sat with him, the king said unto the damsel, 
Ask of me whatsoever thou wilt, and I will give it thee. And she went forth and said unto her mother, What shall I ask for? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in straight away with haste unto the king and asked, saying, I will, that, I will that thou give me now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry. Yet for his oath's sake and for their sakes which sat with him, he could not reject her. And immediately the king set, sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought. And he went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the damsel. And the damsel gave it to her mother. And when his disciples heard of it, they came and took up his, his corpse and laid it in a tomb. Now, it's a certainly, a certainly a politically motivated passage. Indeed, the likelihood of a member of the royal court engaged in a, uh, engaging in a purported erotic dance in front of the king's friends is in both our, both our age, and I'm assuming in that age, highly unlikely. Some scholars, most notably Amy Jill, Le Amy Jill or Amy Joe? Yeah, that's right. I, I have Jill, but then as soon as I said it, it didn't sound right. Um, some scholars, most notably Amy Jo Levine, argue that the Gospels use this story to show what they consider to be the corruption and moral decay of the Herodian court. Regardless, as is typical of the biblical narrative, it supplies more questions than answers. Who is the girl that later tradition, beginning with Josephus, will call Salome? What was the age of this young lass? Was she beautiful? What kind of dance was it? There is little or no indication that it was a dance full of sexual overtones or even undertones. Although Salome would go on to become the symbol of dangerous female seductiveness, we see little of it on display here. Was John the Baptist murdered on account of the erotic dance of a young woman? Was the sexual transgression of Herodias and Herod that John the Baptist seems to have been so critical of on account of its violation of halakha mirrored in his own criminal murder that also derives from sexual desire. Questions abound. It is certainly unclear and it's certainly difficult to read this story in, the ways, in ways that do not import our later constructions. The second iteration of the story comes by way of the Gospel of Matthew, which seems to corroborate the other account, albeit with a little more detail. Again, let me quote the requisite verses. But on Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod, whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatsoever she would ask of him. But she, being instructed before by her mother, said, give me here in the dish the head of John the Baptist, and the king was struck sad. Yet because of his oath, and for them that sat with him at the table, he commanded it to be given, and he sent and beheaded John in prison. And his head was brought in a dish, and it was given to the damsel. And she brought it to her mother, and his disciples came and took the body, and buried it, and came and told Jesus. Then she disappears from the New Testament's mise en scene, departing as quickly as she arrived. Again, who was she? There are debates about her name. Some Greek sources seem to refer to her by Herodias, the name of her mother. One of the first to give her a name was, as I have already mentioned, the Jewish historian Josephus, who lived from 37 to 100 CE, which would presumably have made him a contemporary of the events in question, though I'm sure he didn't attend the dinner. But in giving her a name, he paradoxically erases her face. And I'll explain this in just a few minutes. Salome is the Greek translation of the Hebrew name Shulamit, the, feminist, the feminine form of Shlomo or Solomon, a name which derives from the same root as sh Shalom or peace. Salome is an interesting choice of names and would seem, on first blush, to undermine the rather unwise request of her character. In this, our Salome functions as the polar opposite of two other important Shulamites or Salomes in Jewish history. Salome Alexandra, who lived uh, from 141 to 67 BCE and was one of the only two women to rule over Judea, and the Salome that is occasionally associated with the sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus, someone who was present at the crucifixion. Before I examine what Josephus has to say about Salome, it might be profitable to introduce him a little more. Josephus lived at a time of what we now call the end of the Second Temple period. 
in Jewish history. This period lasted from 530 BCE when the temple was built, the second temple was built, and 70 CE when the second temple was destroyed. And it was a tumultuous period to be sure, one in which the Israelites no longer existed in the proverbial backwaters, but now became caught in the imperial struggles of larger empires, such as Greece and Rome. There was not just the threat of being annexed, but perhaps more importantly, the cultural and religious threat of encountering other cultural groups and their religious traditions. The growing influence of Hellenism, which included forms of Greek culture, such as the gymnasium, uh, and Greek notions of aesthetics, such as the uncircumcised male phallus, forms of religion, the so-called Greek pantheon of the gods, created havoc in the region and culminated in the Maccabean revolt of 167 BCE, symbolized by the miracle of Hanukkah. While things calmed down for a while, the Maccabees quickly became the Hellenistic despots that they initially re rebelled against, and genuine civil war erupted. This gave way to the Roman occupation of the region, which began with Pompey and his sack of Jerusalem in 63 BCE. Judea now became little more than a Roman province, which meant that the Romans needed a titular head there, so the Roman Senate appointed Herod the Great as the King of the Jews. The time of Herod was a time of temporary fluorescence, and perhaps because his own legitimacy was called into question, he decided to go on a massive building program. This included building Caesar, Caesar, Caesarea. That's how you pronounce it in English? I want to say Caesarea. Caesarea. Caesarea to the north of uh, modern-day Tel Aviv, Masada to the southeast of uh, Jerusalem, and various additions to the temple. When Herod died in 4 BCE, just after the birth of Jesus, his kingdom was split into four, with each one of his sons receiving a quarter. This is known as the Tetrarchy. Many of these sons were also called Herod, so the picture becomes sometimes rather confusing. Um, at least two of these sons were called Herod, and Herodias, the mother of Salome, married them both, but not at the same time. She had Salome with one before leaving that Herod and marrying the brother. So interestingly, interestingly, the female seductress, at least on Josephus's narration, appears not to be the daughter Salome, but the mother Herodias. And perhaps this is why, in some traditions, Salome is also called Herodias. Against this larger background, Titus Flavius Josephus, born as Yosef ben Matityahu, into a, was, was born into a Pharisaic family in Jerusalem sometime around 37 CE. He initially fought against the Romans during the first Roman-Jewish war. Under siege by them, he and his comrades decided that they would commit collective suicide instead of surrender. Josephus suggested the method. They would draw lots and kill each other, one by one, counting to every third person. The sole survivor of the process, <coughs> luckily for him, was <laughs> Josephus. Um, for mathematicians in the crowd, this method became a mathematical problem known as the Josephus problem. At any rate, he survived and told the Roman general Vespasian what he wanted to hear, namely that there were ancient Jewish prophecies that foretold that he would become emperor. So Vespasian decided to keep Josephus around as his interpreter. When Vespasian became emperor in 69, he granted Josephus his freedom, whereupon Josephus took the emperor's family name of Flavius. So Titus Flavius Josephus now became a Roman citizen and spent the, right, the rest of his life writing Jewish history for a Roman audience. One author has gone so far as to call Josephus the quote-unquote Jewish Benedict Arnold. Uh, another historian, Mary Smallwood, writes of Josephus, I'm going to quote, that he was, oh, my voice is on that he was conceited, not only about his own learning, but also about the opinions held of him as commander, both by the Galileans and by the Romans. He was guilty of shocking duplicity, and he later turned his captivity to his own advantage and benefited for the rest of his days from the change of side, end of quote. From him, our Jewish Benedict Arnold then, we read about the destruction of Jerusalem, the siege of Masada, and of course, Salome. In his Antiquities of the Jews, which consists of an account of the history of the Jewish people, written for Josephus' non-Jewish reading audience, we first encounter Salome. 
In the 18th book, Josephus informs us, and I'm going to quote, Herodias was married to Herod, the son of Herod the Great, by Mariamne, the daughter of Simon the high priest. They had a daughter, Salome, after whose birth Herodias, taking it into her head to flout the way of her fathers, married Herod the Tetrarch, her husband's brother by the same father, who was a Tetrarch of Galilee. To do this, she parted from a living husband. Once again, I note perhaps that the real seductress in this count is not Salome, but her mother. She leaves one living brother to marry another one in a way that, as we have seen, violates the legality of the Jewish matrimonial law. But note what Josephus does not say. Nowhere does he mention that Salome was responsible, either directly or indirectly, for the murder of John the Baptist. Josephus gives us the name Salome, but in so doing, removes her from the narrative that the Gospels give us. Indeed, Josephus lays the blame of John's death squarely at the feet of Herod, writing, and I quote, for Herod had killed this good man who had commanded the Jews to exercise virtue, righteousness towards one another, and piety towards God. On Josephus' reading, Herod feared the influence that John had over the masses, and that this, <coughs> and this might enable John to, uh, to um, raise a rebellion. So what do we learn from all this? The real Salome, whomever she was, whatever she looked like, howsoever she may have danced, are lost to us. The Christian, that, 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 the Christian Bible gives her a nameless role of seduction, presumably. The persona of the, the, of the power of female seduction, at least as, uh, as vectored by later tradition. Josephus, in naming her, seems to normalize her. In his story, she leads a long life. She goes on to have, become the mother of two boys. But she remains cloaked in mystery, as perhaps she must, the plaything of male artists, such, including Josephus, in which she reveals herself by removing what, once again, only later became the seven veils. Thank you. Thank you.